All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 14th day of June in the year of our Lord, 2022. Well, the reason that this uh, uh, webcast or w website or vlog or whatever you want to call it is titled Thinking Biblically is because Christians must think biblically, think according to God's word, understand things according to God's word. Because we live in a world of darkness, and the only light we have is the Word of God. Christ himself is the very Word of God, and in God's written revelation that we have in the Scriptures. He has revealed the truth to us that sinful humanity can't discover on their own. Science can't discover, because science can't understand, the they can't come to know the truth part of the problem. Even if uh, there are things about God that could not be understood through creation, even by sinless human beings, God must reveal himself. And of course, the perfect revelation of God is Jesus Christ. Now, we see him personally no more. So I wanted to mention something that should be obvious to all Christians, but Sometimes we have to repeat the obvious. Never assume it's obvious. I learned that when you work with other people, you know, especially if, you, if you're if you telling them what to do, if you have sort of a, a supervisory position of some sense. When I was working as an engineer especially, you know, I to don't assume, don't assume they know what you want. Don't assume they understand. Even if it's it's... You know, it's uh, redundant, and you might be afraid of uh, them thinking that you think they're stupid or something like that, and just explain. I just want to make sure, because communication problems cause problems. Uh, to, to make it clear again, this is exactly what I want here. If you have any question about what I, do, I want you to do, ask me. So you don't have to fix it later. Because it's so easy to to misunderstand, but uh, and this is you know the, that's why edu teachers are told to repeat things. And you just sometimes people people just don't want to ask questions because they're they're ashamed or whatever. Questions are never stupid. There's no such thing as a stupid question. The stupid people are those that don't ask questions. Or those that think they understand when they don't, or just assume they understand when they don't. So, uh, yes, questions are a good thing. So uh, let's, uh, uh, even God does not turn away people that ask questions, that are seeking to know the truth. Those that don't care about the truth, that's like, okay. So let's, at the Scripture, this is something that should be very obvious, but let's go to uh, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 3. And I'm not going to go into the context here because these, these are statements that really are universal and you, you don't have to look at context. But if you want to look at the original context, go back to Genesis chapter 15, where God declares Abraham, what Abraham believed that God said, that regarded uh, uh, and what he was accounted righteous for. But the fact is that, God, that Abraham was, was, it says here, for what does Scripture say? Now, of course, the big theme about Paul in all his epistles is really righteousness with God is through faith, through believing God. 
an accounted righteousness, not an intrinsic righteousness, but God regards those as right with him who believe him. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted or reckoned or um, he was regarded as righteous. Accounted to him for righteousness. This is where he goes on to say, but to him who works, his wages are not counted as grace, but a debt. So right, the righteousness that comes from God is a righteousness that's given as a gift to those who believe God. Particularly those who believe the gospel. But uh, uh, believing God, Abraham didn't believe the gospel. He just, in the sense, uh, God had promised that his offspring would be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the heaven in, in multitudes. And Abraham, although he was well past, you know, he was way over 100 and his wife was like 90-something, you know, women that age don't have children. God believed Abraham. He believed God. In, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, uh, God believed Abraham. Abraham believed God. Uh, later, God believed Abraham, too. Abraham believed God. Now, something that was naturally ridiculous, that he would have a biological son through his wife, Sarah. See, God waited until it was impossible. God has a habit of doing this, by the way. Not necessarily he always does it, but it, it, you'll find in your life that often God waits to the point where you can't make it happen. And then when you trust God to do it, it happens. The problem is that we tend to, like Abraham, try to get God's will worked out through ourselves. But that's a little different message there but but the fact that the basic idea is god uh, god uh considers those who believe him as righteous and this was not a case of of believing the gospel the, that he was going to send a son a savior but simply that god said your children are going to be the huge uh, huge number uncountable and this was, again, God waited until Abraham was well over 100 years old, and Sarah was, I believe, in her 90s. <sighs> that it might be God's glory. Now, Abraham and Sarah had conspired to try to fulfill God's promise before this. That didn't work. <laughs> there, they tried to make it happen. Didn't work. Also, let's go to another passage here. Again, I'm not uh, I'm sort of a, not looking at the content because that's not what I'm going to say here so much. But th th this is a consistent principle all through the Scripture. Cor Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven: For we walk by faith, not by sight. It's like Abraham; he had to believe God in what could he could not see. He could not see God, and he could not see the promise. It was a promise. He had to trust God. And, and this is what faith is, trusting God. Not just believing a fact. It's trusting God. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Christians in this world, we must walk by faith in God in what God has said, and not by sight. And some of these issues might be a bit tangential, it seems, like I'm talking about the scientism, and uh, uh, one of the videos I just did was about how science, they have their narrative, and they arrange the facts to support their narratives. And then, of course, the great Dr. Fauci told us to follow the science and made it clear that he was the science. See, but that's not, you know, the Bible talks about that which is falsely called science. The word science simply means knowledge. The knowledge that is not the knowledge of the truth is not knowledge at all. You can f fill your head with facts, but facts are not the same as truth. What are the truth, what are the facts telling you? 
What do you believe the facts lead to? Where do you, you, that's what wisdom, where wisdom comes in. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. It begins with believing God. And as Christians, I think many Christians try to live this double life. Not that they're trying to be sinful, but, you know, the, the Sunday morning, the, the I believe the Bible. Maybe they believe they read the Bible every day and believe every word in it. But they don't apply that knowledge of the Scripture to how they perceive the world. And that causes a great deal of problems. When you believe the Scripture, that causes a different set of problems, like, oh, Lord, Come quickly, Lord Jesus, deliver us from this place, uh, from this sinful world. Yeah, um, but we're here for a purpose until he comes, and that is to, to preach the gospel in all nations, to, to call people to repentance and faith in Christ. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into this world to die for sinners, to bring in a new covenant, to reconcile sinners to God, to make it possible for you to be reconciled to God. Christ died for the sins of the world. God paid a price to save sinners, for God so loved the world. And we need that that's one of the problems with Calvinism is they don't believe that. They believe that God only loved those that he chose to save, chose predestined from before eternity. Well, th th this simply doesn't work biblically. They, they have this understanding, this theology that, that man developed. Well, if man can do it, it wasn't, didn't come from God. And logically to them it's inconsistent that Christ would die for people he doesn't actually save well that's their problem but it, it creates a mentality and I, I found this in my period that I was uh, exploring Calvinism and got into it quite deep that uh, it was it was hardening me it created an attitude in me that was not godly uh, the attitude is, oh, those those dirty sinners are just getting what they deserve. Well, that's not a biblical attitude. It's an attitude, but it's not a godly attitude. It's not the attitude of Christ. Yes, they are hard to put up with, but Jesus said the same thing about his own disciples. How long must I endure you? So, yes, yes, God puts up with us. But he's got a plan. <laughs> and when Christ returns, then we'll all be conformed perfectly to his image. No more sin. Oh, what a day that will be. We'll see him as he is, for we will be like him. Suitable to rule and reign on earth in justice and righteousness and love and mercy, just like Christ. Perfectly walking in the will of God. But, well, we're in this body of sin, not quite so much. Uh, but the, the importance of walking by faith and not by sight. See, we're dominated by physical senses. Our sense of sight, our sense of hearing, smell, touch, all these things, that's what we experience. We don't see heaven directly. We don't see God directly. We don't see spiritual beings directly. The fact that there are angels and demons, there's God and the devil, we have to take that by faith because we can't see it with our eyes. It's beyond human natural uh, uh, senses. So, but the, the problem this causes for us is that we read the Bible, but when we don't walk by faith in what God has revealed to us in the Scriptures, then we have trouble in the world because we, we tend to compartmentalize the two things. And there's other reasons that we do that. Mainly, 
for our own comfort, but eh, which isn't good. But uh, it might be comfortable, but it's not good. So how do we understand what goes, goes on in the world? And you know, we we see the, like the 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 shootings, the cra- crazy shootings on the on the media, and uh, of course the, the, they don't even try to have an explanation for it or any kind of a valid explanation. They just use it for their own purposes. They they use these events. The world uses these events to individuals try to use it for their own causes to further their own agendas. They do that with everything. Everything. Because they're utterly self-centered. You've got to be saved from yourself. See, salvation from sin is salvation from yourself. Your self-centeredness. See, selfish, self-centered people, what would you do in heaven when everything is about God, when everything is God-centered? You'd be miserable, wouldn't you? The only place that you could possibly endure would be like hell. But even then you can't escape God. So... But the, the problem with Christians, and this is something I've been battling with myself my entire life, is perce- perceiving reality, perceiving the world through the Word of God, coming to understand the Word of God and trying to think biblically about what we perceive in the world. It's just like the issue with science and evolution and these things. The world has their explanations that deliberately leave God out. And Christians don't believe that. If you're a Christian and you're trying to believe in evolution, the reason you're trying to do it is not because of the Word of God. It's because you want to please the world. You want the world to accept you. You know, so-called theistic evolutionists. There is no biblical reason to believe that trash, but the desire of the flesh to be accepted by the world explains why they are evolutionists that are trying to be Christians, or Christians that are trying to be evolutionists. The, the desire to be accepted by the world, uh, and we we are born with that desire. We're born with the desire for acceptance and everything else. That's part of our self-centeredness. We want to feel good about ourselves, and that means we want other people to feel good about us too. A lot of times, we find our uh, uh, we we need that assurance that we're good, that other people accept us. Abraham was more concerned with God accepting him, and that's what Christians must be. So, but but that puts us in a difficult situation because we are of the truth and we know the truth in the scriptures and if we express the clear teachings of the scriptures in the world well the world will will not like it and will close their doors to us it's just like in the what's called the the great awakening the the uh first great revival, so-called. I don't necessarily believe there are such things as revivals. I don't think the Bible teaches that. The first great awakening, uh, 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 the, the, largely the preaching of uh, Wesley and Whitfield in England and in America. So this isn't a global event. It's uh, Wesley and Whitfield, who had each had, they, they were friends, and they went to school together, but they had different theologies. One, uh, Wesley was an Arminian, and Whitfield was a Calvinist. Now, Arminianism is, Arminianism is just Reformed Calvinism. <laughs> the Reformed Reformed. Uh, Arminius thought it needed to be corrected to make it more biblical. And I, you know, that's really, but the two will fight like cats and dogs. But Wesley and Whitfield, had the same common message. You must be born again. They went, they went preaching salvation, the, the, the necessity of the new birth. And they found themselves locked out of the churches. Now, this was Anglican England, the state churches, the only, almost, not quite, almost the only uh, uh, 
the official churches were state churches. By this time, others were somewhat tolerated. But uh, that was over the past hundred years at that point. Gradually, more tolerance was being extended to, like, Baptists. I don't think Catholics were quite tolerated yet. After all, they tried to blow up the Parliament building with the Parliament there. That's uh, one of the reasons for... See, there's reasons for persecution sometimes. Uh, also, when the, the King of England declares that he's the head of the church and the Pope says, no, I'm the head of the church, that creates a little tension. But because Christians are of the truth, if we consistently or seek to consistently express the truth of the revelation of God in this world, and say, say in evolution, say, no, that's false. The Bible explains why things are here. And the fact that so-called scientists that don't believe try to justify their unbelief by arranging the facts to fit a narrative they invented called evolution doesn't change the truth. And Christians are hated not because we're evil, but because we don't believe the narrative that the world has sewn together, the fig leaves that the world has sewn together to cover their nakedness, their sin, alluding to the Garden of Eden, of course. But some people might listen that don't know. But Adam and Eve, when they sinned, their eyes were open. They saw they were naked, and they they, they sewed together garments made of fig leaves to cover their nakedness. Now, they, didn't, they weren't ashamed before they sinned. See, the sin brought shame because they were guilty. They tried to hide themselves. It wasn't their physical bodies that were the problem. It was their, their soul, their spirits. They had, they had fallen. They were no longer in a proper relationship with God. And they knew it. And they, and they saw that they were naked, well, naked spiritually. They were no longer righteous. They felt guilt. And they tried to cover themselves. Oh, that doesn't solve the problem. To hide themselves. And when they heard the sound of God walking in the garden, they hid themselves from God. And when they were confronted with what they had done, they blamed others. Say, that's human nature. That's what happened at the fall. And their first children, the elder, murdered the younger because the younger was good and the elder wasn't. The, the younger did what was right in the sight of God, and the older, Cain, didn't. So because Abel's obedience to God, his faith in God, made his older brother look bad, his older brother solved that problem by killing his younger brother. That's how quickly things turned evil. And things haven't changed. And so if we express God's revelation about the nature of reality and the nature of humanity, we are exposing their nakedness. We're exposing their sinfulness. We are exposing and destroying their narratives that are designed to cover their nakedness, like evolution, designed to suppress the knowledge of God, get him out of the picture so they can live comfortably as sinners. Not going to happen. So how do you solve the problem the same way Cain did? Got to get rid of your brother. That's why Christians have been persecuted and killed throughout the millennia. Because Christ, who is light and truth, dwells in us, and that's incompatible with the world. The world wants to hide from God. 
And we are the temple of God. The Christians, we often are confused ourselves because we are so dominated by our physical senses. And we, we, we walk, we, we tend to compartmentalize our Christianity into like Sunday morning and uh, the rest of the week we, we switch over to our worldly mode. Uh, to walk with, according to the world, and then on Sunday morning we try to walk according to faith. Can't do that. When you believe the Bible, see, if you don't believe God's testimony, including Genesis, if you don't believe Genesis 1, you don't believe God. You don't believe God. See, Genesis 1 isn't accepted by the world in the United States. Uh, if, if, you're a, if you want to be a science teacher and you say, I believe the Scripture, I believe the biblical account of origin, do you think you'll be well accepted uh, in academia? Now, some small, some small uh, country town may be thrilled to have you teach biology. But you're not going to get a prestigious position. You're not going to get promotions uh, as far as, like, you won't be teaching in a university someplace. But if you don't want that, well, you know, if you, if you tell the, you go to the school board and say, listen, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. I believe that God created man, as the Bible says. I do not believe the theory of evolution. The the I believe it's just a human attempt to suppress the knowledge of God. If that school board will hire you anyway, well, I think you found a good community. Of course, right now some of them are pretty desperate. But the, but then you have to be consistent with that, and you have to remain outspokenly Christian. It's just like a, a job, whoever you're working for. You have to be willing to act according to Christian values. You have to be of the truth. You have to seek not only your own interests, but also the interests of others, including the interests of your boss and your customers and everybody else. Whether you're a business owner or an employee, you have to be able to be willing to put things on the line and say, no, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. I follow Christ. And I'm not going to lie for you. I'll pray for you. But I'm not going to lie for you. I'm not going to steal for you. I'm not going to do what's wrong in the sight of God as part of my job. And that closes many jobs to you, by the way, because many jobs are simply incompatible with the Christian life, with Christian morality, with the Word of God. And we have to be willing to walk in that, to suffer the reproach of the world, For Christ. If we don't do that, we are no longer the light that's in the world, but we're part of the darkness. The world's got enough darkness. See, people like Rick Warren and Bill Hybels and some of these others, the seeker-sensitive church movement that was so big. Of course, it's turned into a big disaster, but the idea was you don't want to offend unbelievers. You want to create a church where you can bring unbelievers into the church, and they won't be offended. Well, if, if an unbeliever is not offended by Christianity, it's not Christianity. Because the Holy, the Holy Spirit will convict sinners of sin, of righteousness and judgment. That's one of the reasons he's sent into the world. And if a, a, if a, if a unregenerate sinner can attend your church, 
and be perfectly comfortable and not experience the conviction of sin. What does that say? The Spirit of God is not in your midst. He's not in you. And that's Rick Warren, unregenerate. Bill Hybels, unregenerate. Their, their life history demonstrates that. They, they're in love with the world. They care about the world and what the world thinks. And they, they talk about church, uh, churching people, not getting people saved because they know nothing about salvation. They're all about the world. It, it's a, it's a, f a exterior form of Christianity. It's really fig leaves. See, you can, you can have a, a form of Christianity that is really a fig leaves, a, a false Christianity that tells you you're right with God when you're not. Uh, sacramentalism is one way to do that. Oh, you're a Christian because you were baptized. Or the prayer sacramentalism. You, you said the sinner's prayer, therefore you're a Christian. Not if God didn't change your life. Not if the Spirit of God does not dwell in your heart. See, being a Christian is a real God-wrought, God-worked thing. Only God can do it. If man could do it, it's not Christianity. But we, we are saved through faith, by God's gift, by God's grace, through faith. And we must walk in faith daily. We must believe God's word and apply it in all of life. And walk that way. And you might not see what it does. Abraham, the scripture is very clear that Abraham did not experience the promises of God, the, the, the multitude of descendants and everything else. Uh, he had to do that by faith, and, that's, and Abraham was, was promised much, but it's, the New Testament tells us the Old Testament saints did not receive the fullnesses of the problems because God had set, prepared something better that came through Christ, and they will experience that together with the New Testament saints when Christ returns. But, see, we, we all wait earn, eagerly for that fulfillment that comes with his return and the resurrection of the saints and the rapture of the saints when his people are all gathered together with him and are transformed into his image. The fulfillment the, of the new covenant, the ultimate fulfillment. We have it in part, just like Abraham had the blessings and promises of God and experienced some of that in part. But we await the ultimate fulfillment. But when we walk by faith in this world, not by sight, obeying God, doing what's right in God's sight, trusting him, then though we might not see the results of that, there are results. People are either condemned or they're saved, ultimately. As God, as our, our faith in God allows him to use us. So when we take stands like refusing to, to uh, agree with the world because the world is in opposition to what God has revealed, then even though that might not seem significant to you, it might be frightening to you, yet God has a purpose. We're to be light and salt in this age. And people don't like the light. People that love darkness, that are sinful, they love the darkness. They, they love to hide. They don't like the light. And they hate the light. And they flee from the light. You wonder why people don't come to church. Well, that's why. <laughs> they don't want to even be reminded that God exists. So they're not really unhappy about the fact that, that certain large denominations are filled with homosexuals. They think that's good especially if they're priests and bishops and popes, because then they can say, see, God doesn't care if they're sinners or not. 
God doesn't care what they do. So only the, the, those are the only kind of churches that sinners can find comfort in. Because they're not real churches. Because they won't experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit there, in all likelihood. Now there there are some exceptions, you know. There's there's even I've heard of some Catholic priests that are saved and actually preach the gospel. But I think they're rather rare. I think they're rather rare everywhere. But that's uh, we have to walk by faith. We have to believe God, and even faith pleases God. Even walking in you know faith in Genesis one. Faith in Genesis 3. Faith in everything the Bible teaches. When we stand with that, when we say, this is what God has said. The world may say that, but no, God has said this, and I believe God. Whether you do or not, that's your problem. But I believe God. And if that brings persecution, we have to say, so be it. If that brings rejection from the world, so be it. We shouldn't expect others. Anything else? If you want to be at peace with the world, do not become a Christian. Do not even pretend to be a Christian. It won't help you, especially today. But if you you want to be a Christian, that means standing for what the Bible teaches, not just a stripped-down gospel. But standing and said, God has said, including, you know, those hot button issues today like uh, uh, transgenderism and homosexuality and all these other things. We have responsibility to God to believe him and to stand and speak when it's necessary what he has said. That doesn't mean we have to be out there necessarily preaching it. We should proclaim the gospel primarily. But when it's necessary, when the issue comes up and they demand that you take a stand for or against something, that you stand with Jesus Christ. You stand with the Word of God. You said God has called this wrong. He says it's an abomination. And those who live these kind of lifestyles unrepentantly will suffer the wrath of God. That's what the Scripture says. Not just those people that live as adulterers, people that live as idolaters, uh, people that are lovers of money, people that are lovers of lies. Not narrow it down to one or two issues. I mean, the chaplain in the Congress, if he was doing his job, would stand up and proclaim that to the Congress. All liars will find their place in the lake of fire. Because they need fear of God in that institution, and they have no such thing there. No, they hire people to be a chaplain that will soothe their sins. Well, God won't. God has provided the answer for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you will not accept God's answer, you will, not ha- you will have <clears throat> the other answer from God. Every person will either receive God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, or they will experience God's justice. You will be judged by your works. Consider that. Would you rather have God's grace, God's acceptance based on faith in his son, who he sent to die for your sins, to pay the penalty for your sin? Or would you rather experience the full, holy, righteous justice of God? where he will pay you back for what you have done. And 
you will remain eternally unreconciled with God, existing under the frown of God for eternity. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of grace. Do not let it pass. If you hear God's word, if you hear, feel that the Spirit is convicting you of your sin and calling you to Christ, do not close your ears. Call upon God to save you for the sake of Jesus Christ, because Christ died for your sins, to save you from your sin and its just reward. Otherwise, you will have your just reward that you earned. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So the scripture says, do not spend your life trying to put God out of your mind because you will fail. And you will spend eternity in the presence of God, under the wrath of God. There is no escape from God, no hiding. You cannot even hide in death or in hell. Would you rather spend eternity as a saint or a sinner? Consider. Choose wisely. Ask for God's salvation. He gives it freely to whoever who asks. Not simply to be saved from punishment, but be saved from your sin. 